Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly briefing uh, on January 14th, 2021. I want to start by informing you that Alder Barbara Harrington McKinney, uh, who represents District 1, um, had emergency surgery last night. And I know that all of us in the city are keeping her in our thoughts and wishing for a speedy recovery. And I hope that you will as well. Uh, we're going to start by talking about public safety. As you know, last week there was an unprecedented attack on our nation's democracy and seat of government, the U.S. Capitol building. Many people know that the FBI has alerted state capitals nationwide that there may be armed protests at this Sunday and on Inauguration Day. I want residents of Madison to know that even though there is no information about any specific threat to Madison, the Madison Police Department, the State Capitol Police, state law enforcement agencies, and the FBI have been working together very closely to plan for any issues here in Madison. They have put together a coordinated staffing and security plan for Sunday, and there will be a unified command post where all agencies involved will be in the same location and will be able to respond effectively and efficiently to any potential threats. Governor Evers has called in the National Guard for additional staffing support this weekend and next week. I'm hoping that the week will pass without incident, but I want Madison residents to know that we are prepared. I would also ask residents to be alert through the course of the week, use your common sense, and if you see something, say something, and immediately call 911. And now I'm going to ask Acting Chief Wall to give a few more updates uh, on public safety. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and good morning. Uh, certainly, as the Mayor indicated, the, uh, the events that we all witnessed last week are very unsettling. And I think it's very important for residents of Madison and the larger community to recognize that uh, MPD and our law enforcement partners have been really working tirelessly, uh, not only since then, but before then, to ensure that we do everything possible to ensure public safety here for our community. Uh, we have been engaging literally in an uh, around-the-clock planning process uh, internally with our personnel and MPD command staff and certainly working very closely with our external partners both here locally and at the state and federal level. And so a few of the sort of outcomes from that uh, will be a, a certainly an enhanced MPD staffing posture over the next week. Uh, that includes additional MPD personnel and additional specialized MPD personnel uh, in, in the event that they're needed. We are also uh, depending and, and relying on our outside partners, both the State Capitol Police, the Sheriff's Office, University Police, State Patrol, as well as other partners that we have worked with regularly in the past uh, to enhance our capacity to respond to any issues that we might see. Uh, the uh, Certainly, as everyone recognizes, we went through a lot of protest activity over the last year, and one benefit of that is that we have a very solid uh, unified command post process that we have a lot of experience with, not only internally with our folks, but with those law enforcement partners. So we maintain excellent working relationships with the other agencies and are working very closely with them, not only for, through the planning process, but through the response uh, every day between now and the inauguration day. Uh, as the mayor indicated, uh, there is no specific direct threats to Madison or anything in Madison at this point. Uh, with that being said, we work very closely with our state and federal partners to maintain uh, knowledge, situational awareness of the latest intelligence uh, and informational assessments that those agencies are coming up with. We are in regular contact with them, and certainly any changes that we hear from them will cause us to adjust our response uh, accordingly. Now, we are aware of a planned protest event on Sunday, and uh, that's at uh, midday here downtown in Madison, and we will certainly 
have a police presence there. Our job, as always, is to facilitate First Amendment expression while maintaining a safe environment and ensuring public safety. Our folks will be out there to do that, but I do think it's important that people recognize that uh, certainly there could be traffic disruptions, roads blocked, and other issues associated with that type of activity. And certainly if there's not a need to be in the downtown area, that's probably uh, advisable to, to avoid the area. Uh, at this point, there is no specific information about anything occurring in Madison uh, after Sunday, including on Inauguration Day, but because of the uh, sort of national mood, because of the uh, larger national intelligence picture, and as a, out of an abundance of caution, we will continue to maintain an enhanced staffing posture through Inauguration Day, and certainly we'll reevaluate re as things go, and if there's a need to extend it beyond Wednesday, we will certainly do so. Uh, as the mayor said, and I will certainly uh, take an opportunity to reinforce it, uh, it's, it's very important that people uh, report things to us. If things seem suspicious, seem out of place, seem unusual, by all means, call 911, contact MPD, let us look into it, and we would much rather uh, have to investigate things that turn out to be harmless than not be aware of something that is uh, a concern. So please... Uh, help us, help the community stay safe, and uh, we will continue to maintain uh, the posture through the 20th, and if there's additional information that we need to share with the public, we will certainly do so. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'll continue with our regular briefing now. We're gonna be hearing from Public Health uh, Madison, Dane County. We'll also get an update on our Greater Madison Music City project and um, on what's going on in our public libraries. So we'll start with Doug Vagley from Public Health Madison, Dane County. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about uh, public health and the rollout of our vaccinations uh, in Dane County. Uh, as we all know, this is a time we've been waiting for, uh, and it's finally here, um, and we are getting vaccines uh, coming into Dane County on a regular basis. Uh, the supply uh, may not be enough yet, but uh, it is coming, and uh, more and more are rolling in all the time. I just want to touch a little bit about the process. The uh, ACIP, the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, sets recommendations at the federal level. Those recommendations come to the state. The State Disaster Medical Advisory Committee takes those recommendations and they set the criteria for different tiers as to who is priority for the vaccine while the supply is still limited. These uh, recommendations go then to the Department of Health Services who has the final call on actually the, the actual tiers that are set. We take those tiers and we implement them at a local level. Um, I wanna emphasize, and I'll probably say it again, that we are in partnership with a lot of people in Dane County. We are not the only vaccinator. We have approximately 54 vaccinators in Dane County and 84 sites. We work very closely with our healthcare systems on a weekly basis and we get the allotment from the state and then we move people around to wherever we have capacity. And if you can imagine the health systems in Madison along with the public health department, we combined have a lot of capacity to move vaccines very quickly into um, our citizens' arms. Currently, as of January 11th, 25,099 doses have been put into people's arms. Public Health has administered 2,660 doses as of last night. So you can see that we are administering, we're filling the gap in some areas, but our healthcare partners are really doing a, a majority of the vaccinating at this time. We can't uh, identify how many people that translates into quite yet. Uh, as we gather more data, we'll eventually be able to tell how many people have actually uh, received the vaccination. We'll continue to work with our healthcare partners and we'll continue to work with the tiers as established by 
SD map. The tiers that are coming up uh, represent approximately 1.1 million people. Right now, the tier is out for public comment, so we urge everybody that has any comments on the tiers of the next tier 1B to make sure that they submit those comments to SD Mac. If you're not a frontline front healthcare worker, uh, there is no wait list. Um, we don't have uh, the supplies of vaccine to uh, put, uh, put people on, on wait lists. Um, and as I just stated, uh, tier 1B has not been fully uh, established yet, um, but it should be in the next couple weeks. We do, uh, uh, we will see an expansion of our supply, our vaccine supply, and we'll be looking at uh, vaccinating the general public probably in later spring. So until that time, until we have our community fully vaccinated, we do continue to ask that you are uh, taking the appropriate measures to keep yourself and your family safe. Wearing masks, distancing, avoid gatherings, hand washing. These are all important steps to take to ensure that we can reduce the transmission of COVID. In addition to the vaccine, we'll eventually get back to a point of normal. I did want to say that there's a lot of uh, questions about who is priority. Uh, right now, Tier 1A, it, it is explicit that it is frontline healthcare workers are priority, and that's where all of our efforts are being concentrated at this point in time. We will be moving into our, our next uh, tier as soon as the state allows us to move on to that next tier. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I just want to emphasize again uh, that we're asking for people's patience and continued vigilance uh, with respect to masking and hand washing and uh, keeping that six foot distance with folks outside of your household. Um, the vaccine is moving into our community, as you just heard, and getting to the folks who need it the most. Um, and I'm hopeful that in the not so distant future, we'll see a much increased supply a vaccine that will allow more and more of us uh, to be vaccinated. Next, we're going to hear from Angela Puerta, who's in our planning division, to talk about the Greater Madison Music City Project. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mayor, for allowing me to speak about the Greater Madison Music City Project. Um, so this pandemic, its social isolation and its civic disintegration have brought to our community to the brink. Our musicians, music venues and institutions are confronting a crisis that may endure long after infections abate with communities of color disproportionately affected. Music and culture will play a vital role in our economic recovery and racial equity. Urban Community Arts Network, in collaboration with the City of Madison and Dane County, will formally announce the Greater Madison Music City Project on January 19th at noon via Facebook Live. As we rebuild and recover from COVID-19, we aim to develop a partnership between musicians and local organizations and businesses. Our objective is to grow Madison's music ecosystem, so it creates jobs, drives sustainable tourism, and does so inclusively across all communities and demographics. This project will lead to the identity of Greater Madison as a music, emphasizing as a music city, emphasizing the immense cultural and economic contribution music brings to our community. The global consultant sound diplomacy will be discussing how our community can get involved in this effort, why we need to tackle issues in our current music infrastructure and how they will guide us through this process. The first step is to create a music tourism economic recovery plan focused on equity, economic, economy and recovery as key mission. With the participation of Madisonians, the Greater Madison Music City team will start working on, first, 
assembling a wide stakeholder steering group representing the diverse music community. Second, developing and launching an identity with key objectives and demands. Third, creating a cultural infrastructure plan, mapping our music and cultural assets and benchmarking them against the wider city region strategic plans. Fourth, delivering a robust regulatory assessment and key amendments to local and regional policies and complete an economic and social impact assessment. So I would like to invite everyone to join us on Tuesday, January 19th, 2021, so next Tuesday at noon, to hear local artists and music community experts, experts to talk about what our efforts are and how to participate to get involved in this uh, Greater Madison Music Project. For more information, you can visit our web website, greatermadisonmusiccity.com. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for giving us an update on this very exciting project. Um, and last but certainly not least today, we're going to hear from Tana Elias from Madison Public Library uh, with updates on our library services. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. I'm Tana, and I work at Madison Public Library. Um, just a few days after we opened our new Eastside Penny Library on Cottage Grove Road in March of 2020, we were closing our doors system-wide with um, so many services and, and businesses that were closing their doors as well. But our library staff are creative, and we started working to find new ways to offer services within the first week. We purchased more materials for our downloadable collection, thanks to a gift from our foundation. We converted our library card application to an online process so that people could get library cards to check those downloadable collections out. And by May, we launched our curbside pickup and return service, followed by in-person computing, printing, faxing, and scanning appointments. In September, we helped launch the financial services hotline connecting community members to sources of financial assistance. And throughout the year, we worked with the city clerk to offer assistance for in-person absentee voting and on election day. We know our staff and patrons are missing our full service in libraries, and we are too, but we still had a very busy year, so I thought I'd show you. Curbside appointments more than doubled from May to December with nearly 140,000 appointments in 2020. Overall, we checked out 1.9 million items in 2020. Online materials made up more than 25% of our total circulation for the first time ever and nearly 600,000 items. We issued 8,000 library cards, including 3,500 virtual cards, introducing many longtime library users to our popular downloadable collections. We are currently open between 24 and 45 hours a week at all nine libraries and offering curbside pickup service, in-person computer use appointments, and some very limited events, both virtual and in-person. In 2019, we hosted over 6,000 events in our nine libraries, from one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions to cooking and exercise classes to the four-day 60-event Wisconsin Book Festival at the Central Library. After we closed for COVID-19, we continued to work with a wide variety of community partners to continue to provide online events and to host some small, safe activities for our libraries. For example, we served as absentee ballot drop sites, in-person absentee voting sites, and election day polling places for all four elections in 2020. We will continue that service this year in the two elections in the spring. We hosted over a dozen Red Cross blood drives and have others scheduled, including one on February 22nd. We worked with Madison Writing Assistance to move their popular in-person writing assistance program from that in-person experience 
to an online virtual event, helping many apply for jobs, improve their resumes, work on school projects, and improve their writing in general. While we were not able to provide tax assistance in 2020, we are working with two providers, FIDA and AARP, to provide tax assistance at the Central and Lakeview Libraries in 2021. And finally, we used our Dream Bus mobile service to drop off books at 16 sites, including summer school, meal sites, community centers, and schools. You may not know this, but many of our libraries have always served Madison seniors who can't get to the library through our home services program, which delivers books to people's homes and to 27 retirement homes and assisted living, healthcare, and adult daycare facilities. When it was safe to do so, we resumed these services last summer and are continuing to provide these services safely through the pandemic for those who are unable to use our curbside pickup service. Despite the pandemic, we continued to host online author events through the Wisconsin Book Festival in partnership with Madison Public Library Foundation, hosting 70 events last year with over 11,000 attendees. We included authors such as Nikki Giovanni, Stacey Abrams, Salman Rushdie, Yagi Yassi, Claudia Rankine, and our own Madison Poet Laureate, Angela trudel Vasquez. We have four events scheduled so far this year, with our first event on February 16th with author Emily St. John Mandel. You can find all events online at wisconsinbookfestival.org. Moving forward, we're hosting online virtual events like Crafternoon. We are continuing, continuing our summer reading program, which we call We Read. We have been working with teens in the juvenile justice system to do in-person events focusing on art, creativity, and self-expression. We are working with local authors in our community, young voices, such as 12-year-old Tika Taze and uh, Libby Scanlon, who are creating books and videos that we are help, helping to promote. We are continuing to work with teens through internship programs and virtual art exhibits. And many more opportunities uh, through partnerships with local organizations. We would like to invite you to come to the library and use our services by appointment and find out more at madisonpubliclibrary.org. Thank you. Thank you, Tana. That's a really remarkable amount of things that our library system has been able to do even throughout the pandemic. Um, so I have a number of updates uh, as well, and then we'll get to questions. Um, just a reminder uh, that we have issued a new public health order out of the um, Public Health Madison-Dane County. It went into effect on the 13th. It will be in effect for 28 days. It's very similar to order uh, number 11. The previous order allows indoor gatherings of up to 10 people with physical distancing and face covering. Uh, change is outdoor gatherings of up to 50 people are now allowed with physical distancing. This current order is designed to continue to prevent the spread of disease in our community. And although small gatherings are allowed, it is still safest to only gather with your household members as gatherings remain a driver of transmission. If you do gather, wear a mask, keep it brief, keep it distance, and stay outdoors uh, if at all possible. The previous order was in place for 28 days and subsequent orders will continue to be issued in 28 day increments, which is two incubation periods of the COVID-19 virus. Um, and each order is developed in response to our latest local data. 
Uh, also want to uh, remind folks that uh, myself and uh, Dane County Executive Joe Parisi announced the creation of an estimated $16.2 million emergency package to help prevent evictions in our community uh, based on relief funding received from the federal government. Um, we know that the uh, economic downturn as a result of COVID-19 continues to cause record levels of unemployment and housing instability. So this a new direct assistance for tenants and landlords um, will be very much appreciated in our community. Um, the uh, funding is anticipated to be distributed quickly, given the severity of the need in the county and in Madison, um, and will be focused on clearing any back rent owed uh, for tenants who make 50% of the area median income or less. And the federal government requires that the households uh, be uh, those in which one or more person has is unemployed and has been unemployed for longer than 90 days. Uh, so that will be a priority. Um, and uh, we also will be looking uh, at eligibility for households to get assistance if one or more of the individuals qualifies for unemployment benefits, has experienced a reduction in household income, um, or has experienced other financial hardship directly due to COVID-19, uh, or where you can demonstrate a risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability. Um, landlords can apply for assistance on behalf of their tenants, or tenants can apply directly. Um, and we will be working with landlords um, to make sure that tenants uh, get the security that they need. Um, stay tuned for more details. Uh, we are working with the Tenant Resource Center and we'll be working with a number of other organizations in our community to roll this program out. Um, so if you are in need, uh, please uh, hold on because help is coming. Um, and for any landlords out there, uh, again, I would ask you to uh, show grace to your tenants because help is on the way and we are really trying to prevent evictions in our community. I also want to remind folks um, that I have introduced um, a resolution to provide a grant of $250,000 to the Center for Black Excellence and Culture. Um, this uh, resolution has been introduced. It's been referred to the Economic Development and Finance Committees of the city. Um, this center, which was recently announced, uh, will be constructed on Madison's south side. Um, and will be a shared space to celebrate Dane County's black community while showcasing black excellence to audiences at the local, state, and national levels. Um, this funding from the city, if approved by the council, uh, will support crucial pre-development work as the center continues to establish uh, its strategy and plans um, in anticipation of construction. Um, this, the center will have a focus on black businesses, and in addition to that, it will fill a decades-long lack of a shared cultural space uh, for the black community, uh, celebrating black culture and history and providing a venue for community members to connect and grow. Um, so I'm excited uh, for the center and happy that the city can be a part uh, of making it a reality. If you live in the uh, Odana area, there are upcoming meetings about the Odana area plan um, and the areas around uh, West Town. Uh, the planning division is beginning another phase of this uh, virtual public participation for the Odana area plan. Um, there are two uh, dates. One is a lunch and learn on January 21st at noon, and the other is an evening engagement on January 27th at 5.30. Staff will present draft concepts, gather input, and facilitate discussions about future land use, transportation, parks, and open space, and other neighborhood elements. Uh, the presentations will be in English, but you can request an interpreter or other accommodations. Uh, both events will cover the same content. For more information on those events, how to sign up, or about the planning process in general, there is an Odana Area Plan website. Uh, go to cityofmadison.com and look for the planning division, um, and you'll be able to find it from there. Also want to remind folks that this week is Wisconsin Salt Awareness Week. It's the first ever 
Wisconsin Salt Awareness Week and uh, our water utility here in Madison is reminding people to protect our lakes, rivers, streams, and most importantly, drinking water uh, by using less salt this winter. Uh, we are showcasing all week best practices for responsible salt use. Uh, there's a series of daily live streams on Facebook um, and lots of other information out there um, on how you can uh, reduce your own salt use and impact. Um, if we don't reduce the amount of salt that is reaching our drinking water wells, the water at one well could actually start to taste salty within the next 15 years, and two others will start to taste salty within the next 40 years. It's really important to understand that once you put salt down on the ground, it does not go away, and it can really severely harm our freshwater ecosystems um, and our drinking water wells. About half of the road salt that is used in Madison is put down on sidewalks, driveways, and parking lots, um, not on streets. So we really need the private sector to partner with us in reducing your salt use. Property managers can attend smart salting trainings um, via SaltWise, Wisconsin SaltWise, to learn the best practices. I encourage you to tune in to all of the events this week and to learn more, particularly if you're somebody who's responsible for putting salt down. A couple of updates on our services next week um, in light of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day holiday. Um, our metro transit service will be reduced on Monday the 18th. Uh, most metro buses will follow Saturday schedules. Um, and there are a few other um, tweaks to the service, so I encourage you, if you're taking the bus, um, which you, of course, should be, please check the Metro website for schedule updates. Uh, standing paratransit rides are also canceled on Monday, January 18th. Um, if you want a ride on that day via paratransit, you'll need to schedule a casual ride. And rides are eligible according to Saturday schedules. Um, if you have questions about Metro, Metro service, please call 608-266-4466 or email mymetrobus at cityofmadison.com. We also will not have any refuse recycling, pickup, or drop-off services on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, so the, uh, if you are scheduled to have your trash and recycling collected on Mondays, you should instead put your carts out for collection on Tuesday, January 19th. And folks that have a regular Tuesday day should also put their carts out on Tuesday as usual. City offices are closed on the 18th in observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, but all emergency services will be open, of course. Um, if you need emergency assistance, please call 911. Um, you can also continue to use the report a problem feature for non-emergency issues. Um, and on the good side of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I invite you to join me and Dane County Executive Joe Parisi and a host of other fine folks on Monday the 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, for the City County Humanitarian Awards Ceremony. Um, and I'm delighted that this year we will be honoring with awards um, Representative Sheila Stubbs, Lalita G, and Shira Adams. Uh, you can log into the event at mlkingcoalition.org. That's mlkingcoalition.org. It's going to be a great evening of music, speakers, and gratitude for individuals who are working to honor the legacy of Dr. King every day in our community. In other good news, um, multiple city buildings and the City of Madison fleet were named Dane County Climate Champions. This uh, Climate Champion program is started by Dane County to recognize entities throughout the county that are reducing their energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, delighted that the city is joining uh, more than 25 other Dane County Climate Champions, uh, businesses, local governments, and nonprofit organizations who are leading on climate action. Um, and just want to shout out um, we, our facilities department. Um, there are four buildings that are recognized, um, including this building that we're standing in, the Madison Municipal Building, which is a LEED Platinum building. Um, 
And a special shout out to Monona Terrace Community and Convention Center, which uses 25% less energy than comparable facilities. Um, our fleet uh, is also dramatically reducing their energy use. They've converted more than 500 vehicles uh, to be lower emission and reduced emissions by more than 4.3 million pounds. Um, so encourage you to learn more about the climate champions and if you're in a position to do so, to follow our lead to reduce your emissions. Just a note that effective on the 19th, the Madison Public Library centralized phone reference service and financial resources hotline service hours are changing. The new hours for both services will be 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekdays and noon to 5 on Saturdays. Um, also, uh, starting earlier this month, the Monroe Street Library hours shifted to Monday 10 to 6, uh, excuse me, Monday, Tuesdays, and Fridays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and if you have uh, more questions about library services after what you heard from Tana, um, please visit the Madison Public Library website. Um, where you can also learn about uh, the 50 plus cookbooks that have been added to the collection thanks to a recent grant from the University of Wisconsin Madison Center for East Asian Studies. I want to say thank you to the program for the grant. Um, the new cookbooks focus on food from China, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Tibet. And the titles were selected to increase cultural perspective and raise awareness about the history, food systems, indigenous ingredients, ingredients and unique cooking practices of uh, the ancestral and modern food traditions and recipes of East Asian culture in Madison. I know a lot of folks have been doing some extra pandemic cooking, so here's a great opportunity to pick up one of those cookbooks curbside and um, expand your palate a little bit. Finally, um, community resources and upcoming meetings. Um, as usual, just a, an alert on various community resources that are available to help folks. Um, it's been a very tough year with the pandemic and I uh, really encourage folks to reach out for help if you need it. Our housing helpline at the city, which you should contact if you are homeless or in danger of losing your housing, is 608-264-0549 or you can email housinginfo at cityofmadison.com. If you need help accessing internet or phone service, call the State Public Service Commission at 608-267-3595. If you need help finding a child care provider, call a referral specialist at 608-216-7022. If you need help accessing emergency food options or other social services, call United Way of Dane County at 211 or text your zip code to 898-211. The city off also offers a free financial resource hotline for folks who uh, have been impacted by the pandemic. You can visit cityofmadison.com slash financial hotline or call 608-315-5151. These resources and more are posted at cityofmadison.com. Click on the community resources link off of the homepage. Uh, upcoming meetings also on the homepage, cityofmadison.com. You can find our meetings calendar. All meetings are virtual at this point in time. Uh, and you can click through to see agendas to find out how to sign up to attend or to testify at meetings. Um, and there's also a list of all of the meetings that are happening in the city. Here's a brief uh, highlight of some of them. On Thursday, January 14th at 2.30, the Early Childhood Care and Education Committee will meet. At 4.30, the Community Development Authority. At 5, the Digital Technology Committee. At 5, also the Police Civilian Oversight Board. Also at 5, the Equal Opportunities Commission. And at 5.30, the Community Development Block Grant Committee. On Friday, the 15th at 6 p.m., the Body Worn Camera Feasibility Review Committee will meet. On Tuesday the 19th at 4.30, the Common Council Executive Committee meets, and at 6.30, the Common Council meets. And on Wednesday the 20th at 5.30 p.m., the Alcohol License Review Committee will meet. And that is what I've got for this week. That was a lot. Uh, I know we will have questions, um, so let's start with questions for the Chief. Okay. Chief, I have a few questions from a number of different reporters for you. 
Um, one of the first ones is, will there be road closures on Sunday as we prepare for protests? So we're still finalizing the plan, and, and there may or may not be pre-planned road closures, but it's not unusual in some of the activity that we've seen for there to be spontaneous road closures that we have to assist with if there's a march or a movement of, of crowds. So we just don't have a clear answer to that yet. What is your message for businesses and residents who are downtown? Well, certainly I think uh, it's important that people are, are very aware of their surroundings and really you know, take a little extra time to, to do what's appropriate to maintain their personal safety. Certainly the uh, sort of the national mood and the, and the focus of at least sort of one perspective of the groups that we're preparing that might be here is very focused not just on the government but on the state capitol buildings. And so uh, even if you look at what happened in, in Washington last week, uh, I'm not aware of any damage or any attention being focused on private businesses. It was all very government-centric uh, in terms of the response, in terms of the violence and, and the property damage. Now, certainly, as we've seen over the past year, uh, it's you know these things are unpredictable, and there's no way to, to know exactly how a crowd or a group is going to respond or going to act. Uh, but I think that's... Uh, just gives a little bit of perspective that hopefully would, would help. And again, going back to the comment about uh, uh, potential traffic disruptions and other things, uh, obviously I think there's a potential for uh, fewer people to be downtown on Sunday and, and on uh, Wednesday, fewer you know people coming to work and, and sort of doing their normal course of business. Okay, the next question is, you referenced earlier in your, in your presentation specialized personnel. What do you mean by specialized personnel? So really, I'm talking about our, our specialized teams, like our special events team, which is our crowd control team, our tactical team, traffic team, things like that. So they will supplement uh, our normal patrol personnel and normal response personnel. And in your previous comments, you also referenced planned uh, events downtown on Sunday, a planned event. And the question is, is that the urban triage event? Well, so there's, there's sort of potential for two things on Sunday. So as people have probably seen, there's sort of a national message that has gone out about an armed march election focused at the U.S. Capitol and at each of the state capitals. And sort of that message has uh, actually included the addresses of all the state capitals. And that's a national message, but certainly uh, we're preparing for the potential that that will drive some folks to come here to our state capitol. Then in addition to that, there is a, uh, a planned uh, or at least advertised protest or demonstration regarding the Kenosha uh, decision and uh, I don't remember who the organizers of that are, but that's sort of a, a second group that, that we've seen indication that could happen on Sunday. Um, so there's really two separate things on Sunday. Okay, thank you. And we have one question for Doug Vagley with Public Health. Thank you, Doug. If vaccines are left over in a phase, can people who are not eligible in that phase still get one of those vaccines? So I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, but we have not had to deal with that situation yet. Uh, our supply, our demand is far outstripping our supply of vaccine. So if there were any vaccine that was left over at a vaccinator, we have the ability to move that vaccine to a different location where the demand may be. So up to this point, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we haven't been able to or haven't needed to uh, go beyond 1A. Also, recent state guidance has elevated the law enforcement agencies and firefighter agencies uh, throughout Dane County into our next uh, tier. So at this point in time, if we did have access after 1A, we would be working with local law enforcement and fire departments to uh, bring them in to make sure that they uh, have the necessary doses. Thank you, Doug. Mayor, that's all the questions we have for today. All right. Thank you all very much uh, for tuning in, and we will see you next week, same time, same place. And have a great week. Stay safe, everybody, and stay warm, and keep on masking up.
Thanks.